Hi, this is Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, the President, Founder, and Chief Listening Officer here at our network at USA Global TV and Radio. Thank you so much for your loyalty. Thank you so much to all of our guests, to our team members, to our sponsors, and to all of our elevated listeners. Here at USA Global TV and Radio, we provide world-class education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. We celebrate all of our team members, all of our guests, and all of our sponsors from around the world who come and lead their lives with their hearts to help other people walk into their greatness. If you'd like to be a guest on any of our shows, please go over to our website, usaglobaltv.com, and book your session. Please contact us at info at usaglobaltv.com and subscribe to our channel. Hello, USA Global TV and radio watchers and listeners. I am so glad to be back. And this is going to be my more permanent time slot for our talking heads together. So last week, we started exploring a little bit more about um, our personality and how that sort of works. And today we're going to dive a bit deeper. So when we think about personality, there is a few different things that sort of has an influence on it. We are not born and left the way we are. There are some genetics that play into it. And then, of course, there are some environmental and other aspects like we saw last week. So jumping into today's session, what we're going to look at is the ocean. Well, it's not quite as wide. It might be as deep. We never know. So let's jump into our slides and have a look what we have for today. So today's lesson is lesson number two. If you did miss lesson number one, just go back on our channel and have a look at that one. So for today, here's a bit of a riddle. It is well for the world that in most of us, by the age of 30, the character has set like plaster and will never soften again. Now, William James said this in 1890, quite some time back. And in the meantime, we discovered that, well, we're not quite set as plaster and there's quite a few things that we can still change into our ripe ages just before we decide to leave the planet. So now knowing that and from last week, understanding that we are like all people, we are like some people, and we are unique and like no other person because we are a combination of a whole bunch of different things. Let's discover a little bit more about ourselves. So I know that I promised that we will look into the ocean and see what is happening for us. And before we do that, I thought it would be fun to do a little quiz. So thinking about ourselves, I want you to answer the next couple of questions on a scale. So the scale is from one to seven. One is disagree strongly. Seven is agree strongly. And then of course, everything in between is a moderation of that with four being in the middle where we don't really agree or disagree. So let's see. Question number one. Also, make sure that you do number your questions as you go through these. I will give you the um, tablet so that you can decipher your answers at the very end of our show so you know exactly where you fall. 
So question number one. Um, I see myself as extroverted, enthusiastic. On the scale of one to seven, who do you fall? Next one, I see myself as critical, quarrelsome. Number three, I see myself as dependable, self-disciplined. Still on our scale from one to seven, with one being disagree strongly. I see myself as, number four, anxious, easily upset. Number five, I see myself as open to new experiences or complex. Still using our scale. I see myself as number six, reserved, quiet. I see myself as number seven, sympathetic, warm. And then for the last three, still using our scale from one to seven, disagree strongly being one, agree strongly being seven, Number eight is, I see myself as disorganized, careless. Number nine, I see myself as calm, emotionally stable. And the last one, I see myself as conventional, uncreative. So now that you have 10 scores there, leave that to the side. We will go through our OCEAN acronym and then at the end I will give you guys the scoreboard so that you can calculate it for yourself and discover where you lie on our personality test. So let's jump into OCEAN. Yes, it is not the very wide ocean. I did think, however, that a little um, sea star might be fun to use as it has five fingers and it works well with ocean. So first off, openness. So O for ocean in openness. Here we look at the experience interaction scale. So we'll go through all of them and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into each one. The next one in ocean is the C which is conscientiousness. This is an a, a, our approach to order scale. Then next we have E, which is extraversion, our energy recovery scale. Then the next one is agreeableness, how likely we are to say yes or no scale. And then the last one is neuroticism. And this is our emotional stability scale. So that's the five elements ocean is made out of. And ocean is one of those very rare personality tests that has actually been utilized within the scientific community quite rigorously. So it is one of the, I think, almost only ones that is scientifically proven. So there's been a lot of studies around the ocean um, scale and seeing how people actually group themselves. So this scale, thinking about our we are like many, some and ourselves is part of the yes, we are like many in the sense that everybody has these five, right? We are like some in the sense that our family will most probably be very close related. We are like only ourselves in the sense that the combination that we have is very unique. So understanding that, let's dive a bit deeper. So in openness, if we look at it and it is a scale and that's why I have that blue bar at the top. So we can slide along the scale and we can be at any end or somewhere in the middle of the scale. 
Now, if we are low open, when we get to our scores, anything that we get that's 4.4 or less than 4.4, we are low open. Now, low open people are more traditional. Um, they really like routine. They like to um, participate in more traditional types of roles, environments, and they are not big fans of change. Whereas if we go, when we go to the other side of the scale and we are very high open, we find that the score in this area is around the 6.6 .6 range or higher. And here we find that people are very adventurous. So um, for high open people, they're very creative. They enjoy artistic and cultural endeavors. And they have multiple and complex in, um, interests as well as ways of constructing things for themselves. So they like complex types of things and things that really uh, tickle their brain in different areas. So this is the open area of the scale. Then the next one is conscientious. Now, conscientious is, when you think back, the area around our structure or our um, order sort of scale. So when we are very low on conscientiousness, we have a tendency to be very spontaneous. So low conscientious, they found in the studies with a, quite a large number of people that they took through this um, test, that low conscientious is around the 3.2 mark and below. Then we are low conscientious and we become really very spontaneous, we thrive on chaotic environments. So when you think about, for instance, a jazz band, right? The people playing in the jazz band need to be able to understand the bass structure of the music, but also be able to adapt and do a few different other things while they're playing with other people in the band. And you can change players out and they will be able to adapt. So in that sort of environment where there's, there's a tiny bit of structure, but there's a very open-ended structure, people that's low conscientious really thrive in that type of environment. And they also really, uh, they can also easily adapt. So if we think about open, if we have a person that's high open and very low conscientious, we can see how they can be extremely flexible in specific areas. Whereas when the person are low conscientious and maybe also lower in the open, the flexibility might not be as much. So these things also have an impact the one on the other. Then when we look at high conscientious, this are people, this is, is, it's really people that enjoy structure, right? They enjoy order. Things need to go a certain way for them. Um, the environment, they will have very structured and ordered. The way that they think will be very structured and ordered. And of course, the way they do things will be very structured and ordered. They also have a tendency to be able to persevere quite well. They do really well in activities, for instance, when we go to university or we study in school. Because they are structured, it's easy for them to be in environments where structure is appreciated. And then, of course, if there are areas or environments or situations where there is a lot of chaos that comes into the environment, this might upset the little apple cart a bit more because they'll need to find the structure, the thing that keeps it stable for them in order for them to handle 
the chaos. So taking into consideration that each one of these sides have some um, pros and have some cons to them. So the next one in our OCEAN acronym is extraversion. So extraversion um, is the energy element, the way that we conserve and utilize our energy. So when you think about an environment that you really thrive and you love it, right? This might be for the introverts on this spectrum. So the people that are more reserved and these are people that they normally get a score between 2.4 and lower. So these guys really enjoy their own space. They want to have their own space. We find this in um, environments such as engineering quite a bit. So there's quite a few people that are more towards the introvert side of the scale. Um, another thing about introversion and extroversion, a way to think about it is if I have a bag of coins, right, when I'm an introvert and I interact with other people, I'm actually dishing out my coins. I'm taking coins out of my bag and giving it to others. And then after a while, if I interacted too much, my bag will be empty. So I need to go to a quiet space to fill up my bag with new coins. That's the way that I actually get energy. If on the other side, I'm an extrovert, the same bag, and I interact with other people, they give me coins. So my bag gets filled up when I'm around others. On the flip side, however, when I'm on my own, when I'm somewhere where I don't interact with people, so say for instance, we had an extrovert and the extrovert had to do data analysis on their own in the basement. Extreme case, right? That extrovert will literally have to then start to use from their bag. And at a stage, if you leave them down there long enough, their bag will be empty. So that's the difference between extroverts and introverts. So extroverts really enjoy groups. They might enjoy very big groups. So also for the extroverts and the introverts, there's a bit of a difference depending on where we are on the scale for the sizes and the amount of people that we can interact with that actually fills us up. Now, this specific piece also has a little bit of a twist. There's a middle. So for extroversion, the middle is known as ambiversion. So if I'm an ambivert, I do a little bit of both. Now, on the ambivert scale, you will see that it's between about 2.4 and 5.6. So it is a fairly big-ish scale, right? And depending on where I lay on that scale, I might be ten, I might tend to go more toward the introvert side of things or more towards the extrovert side of things. And certain um, environments and certain groups might give me a lot of energy and other ones might actually drain a lot of energy. So understanding where it is that we lie within the scale will help us a lot to be more productive in the areas where we work, in the areas where we socialize at home, right? So understanding that I need to have quiet time, for instance, if I'm an introvert, when I get home, I need to have a space where I can do that. Because if I don't have that space, I'll get more drained when I'm at home and then I go back to work, and if I don't have that space at work either, I'm going to be exhausted. And the flip side, of course, for the, the extroverts, 
if they don't get filled up by being between people, so if they stay on their own at home, so they have a very long night, right? They don't have any interaction with other people. And then they go to work and they need to do data analysis in the basement. The extrovert is most probably going to become a very, very grumpy person. So understanding what it is that we need to fill ourselves up is vital within this space. Then going on to the next one is agreeableness. Now, when we look at agreeableness, we will see that there's this yes, no sort of notion that's playing out. If we are very high on agreeableness, it means that we are most probably friendly. Uh, we like to support and we empathize easily. And we have a tendency to say yes quite easily, right? We might not even think about it first. Somebody will ask you something and you go, yep, yep, that's not a problem. I'll get it done. And then later on, you might go to your calendar or your table and you see, oh, crap, I have so much work. I can actually not get it done. So agreeableness has, again, its advantages and disadvantages. So understanding what we can say yes to and what we cannot say yes to when we are very high on agreeableness is very important. Now, the flip of that being very low on agreeableness, of course, is the other side of this coin. So looking at our scale, we can always also fall in the middle. So we have a little bit of both. Um, but generally, we have a little bit more to the one side or a little bit more to the other side. And when we are low on agreeableness, these are the people that I think of as our devil's advocates. And yes, they might not always be pleasant to work with, but they are vital to help us in our work environment, in our social environments, in our home environments. Because if we don't have the person that actually critically looks at things and asks those difficult questions, we will never know whether we're going to fall in a big hole or not, or whether we're going to um, take some risks into consideration. So having a person that is low on agreeableness, we can utilize that strength of these really well but we need to know how to do that and that it is a strength right so for them they like to be um, in those critical questions they enjoy those confrontation moments and heavy debates and they will most probably when you ask them to do something or help with something say no first and then maybe later on, once they went through their schedule and they saw that it's a possibility for them to help, they'll come back and say, yeah, okay, I can help you with that. So that is where we are on our agreeableness scale. Then the very last one is our neuroticism. Now on neuroticism, if we are very low on neuroticism, it means that emotionally we are stable so this is a score of 2.9 or lower and here normally these people are more prone to being free spirits they generally more happy-go-lucky and depending on where we are on the scale so the further we are on the scale towards the one side where we actually go almost I won't say off the scale, but to the very end of it, closer to zero, right? We'll find that the people are more happy-go-lucky towards that side than, for instance, at the 2.9 area or maybe the 3 area. And then they also generally have a very positive outlook on life. On the other hand, for our high neurotic people, they have a tendency to be very vigilant. They worry about everything, right? Um, if we're going to go on a trip, 
they'll be the people that think about the spare tire that needs to be fixed before we go, go on the trip because we haven't fixed it yet. They'll think about all the possible things that can go wrong. They will think about the whole trip itinerary. Um, they will think about possible routes and route B, C's and D's in order for us to get to our destination safely. So they are also a lot more sensitive to negative cues. So one of the things that happen with high neurotic people is that when we interact as human beings, they will think the worst first, right? And they even more prone than others to do that. And they are very, very sensitive to risk. So now that we have an overview of our ocean, let's discover where you actually came out. So the way to calculate your own scores, remember you did your counting from 1 to 10, right? So to determine openness, you take the score for number 5 and then you add 8 minus the score for number 10, divide that answer by 2. Right, so say for instance my score for number 5 was 10. Uh, uh, 7, sorry, because our scale is from 1 to 7. <laughs> so if my scale for number 5 was 7, right, and my scale for number 10 was 1, so I'll take 8 minus 1, which is 7, and I add that to the 7 that I have at score number 5. So 7 plus 7 is 14. And 14 divided by 2 gives me 7. Right. So going back to our openness, that would mean that I'm high open. So the next one is conscientiousness. So for conscientiousness, we have the score at number 3. Plus, we take 8 minus the score at number 8. And then we divide that by 2. For extroversion, we have the score at number 1. Plus, 8 minus the score at number 6. And then we divide all of that by 2. For agreeableness, we have the score at number 7 plus 8 minus the score at number 2, and then we divide that by 2. And neuroticism, we have the score at number 9, plus 8 minus the score at number 4, and then we divide that by 2. And that will give you your ocean score. If you can't remember exactly whether you are open or um, high or low in any one of these, you can always go back and watch this video again, seeing as we have it at USA Global TV and Radio, as well as on our YouTube channel. And that brings us to the end of our lesson for today. If you would like to reach out to me, please do so via my email. My email is mariska at journey to the number two discover.com or alternatively, please connect via LinkedIn. I would love to hear from you and it would be even better if we can discuss a little bit around what you find in your ocean score and how these different elements work together for you. And that is the end of our lesson for today. Thank you very much and I look forward to our next one where we will dive a bit deeper into our personalities and who I really am. Until next time, bye!